If you've had the opportunity to visit the exhibit on view, um, the world and maps, 1400 to 1600, as just mentioned, um, you had the chance to walk along excellent Portland maps, approach early globes, and examine early schematic models of the Earth. If you've been joining our series of recent talks, you've had the chance to hear from experts, scholars at the top of their field about different types of maps and their cartographic backgrounds. Um, and of course, we have more upcoming talks that I'm sure will be plugged at the end of our session here this afternoon. Um, what I'm going to do today is a little bit different. Um, in the limited amount of time I've been graciously allotted, I hope to continue to push just a little bit what you think of as a map and what it can do. If you humor me just, just a moment, I want to linger on my title. Um, what is thought of as unusual or uncommon is not only culturally contingent, but also predicated upon individual experiences. Is the subway map part of your understanding of your city or is it an exotic tourist keepsake? If a map drawn on a diner napkin is less common than simply opening Google Maps, does, it compare, does its comparative rarity render it worth talking about? Many things that were once usual are now rendered strange and, and unusual and vice versa. So how I, will I be highlighting items that might be considered uncommon or unusual? I cannot, naturally, I cannot touch on every map I've ever encountered that has elicited a gasp or a chuckle. Uh, rather, I want to introduce you to a small variety of objects that might challenge your idea of how a map can be made, used, or executed. Some may indeed be familiar, uh, but I hope others push your boundaries uh, just a little bit. Um, I've highlighted objects that primarily fall outside the purview of the current exhibition. Um, however, there are still some objects in here that are currently on view, and I've tried to highlight them. So when you come, you can take a look and see. Maps, in nearly all contexts, offer up stories to the viewer. Why is that canal named that way? When was that development planned? Who is allowed to live there? But some maps offer ways of integrating particular types of storytelling into their design itself. More than just prompting the curious viewer to reflect on their built environment, these encourage the viewer to conjure up specific stories. And in the cases I'm just about to touch on, episodes primarily from the biblical books of Exodus and Numbers. Ah, this is an example of an object that's on view right now on the first floor. You can go look at it. It is gorgeous. And honestly, the photo doesn't do it justice. Um, this vivid Portland chart of the Mediterranean outlines the contours of Europe, North Africa, and a portion of Western Asia with names of ports. So rather than drawing a line around the coast, you have these names of ports delineating uh, the difference between land and sea. This map, made by Judah Benzara in 1505, um, has topographic and botanical details that fill in these continents. So we have lakes, mountains, and palm trees. Although you may never use a map quite like this in your 21st century life, many of the elemental components are visible and identifiable. This looks like a map, especially once your eyes have sort of adjusted to the unusual use of like ports, right? To like trace the outline versus, you know, when you open Google Maps, maps you usually have a high contrast difference between say ocean and land using uh, blue and green. However, as your eye travels along the sinuous North African coast, noting those port names, you come across a strange red appendage. Both in size and saturation, it stands out from the soft cream color of the parchment. For the initiated, identification is simple. We are looking at the Red Sea, naturally. For our medieval map and novitiates, this might be a little bit humorous, right? Such a literal mode of representation seems a bit uh, forceful, a bit over the top, um, but yet incredibly effective. Once you know you've seen the Red Sea, you've seen the Red Sea. Looking a little bit closer, we can better observe a land bridge that has formed at the top, separating the leftmost lobe from the rest of the body of water. I love the little waves as well. It's such a nice detail to emphasize, yes, this is a sea. 
This is, as Benzara notes, on the parchment itself, the point at which Moses parted and crossed the Red Sea. Rather than filling back in, as is usually part of the account, uh, the bridge is permanently open, open, freezing that particular instance in time and memory. The narrative preservation rends the moment persistent lest you think this is the only time in which the Red Sea is so immortalized, I can assure you that it is not only repeatedly represented in Portland's as this sort of red appendage, uh, but that this mode of representation has bled into other contexts. In this slide, a map of bodies of water and green and, well, red, spill across the gutter of this opening and up into the space around the text block. This opening is from Gregorio Dati's La Sfera, a work on geography, navigation, and astronomy rendered in verse, which if you might wonder why would I need a book on geography and verse, uh, they were incredibly popular in early modern Italy. So, you know, getting your geography lessons with a little bit of rhyme. This map here is more conceptual than geographically correct. The bodies of water are unlabeled and attenuated, strange cities float and sort of undelineated space. And as you may have already noticed, the Red Sea, looking a bit like an inflamed like appendix, stretches onto the page. Although deprived of Moses's parting here, other biblical moments are suspended around the page. One, the ark, marooned atop a mountain and looking rather cube-shaped, uh, is visited by a dove who signals the waters have receded. Another, the Tower of Babel, circled and sort of in the middle here, still intact, still standing, still awaiting the moment when it will fall. Other later publications take a more exacting approach to using maps to tell stories. This map of the path of Moses appears in a 1599 English translation of the Bible, with the cardinal directions carefully annotated along the border and oriented a way that we would expect with north and the north at the top, south at the bottom. I almost said north the north. You understand north at the top, south at the bottom. The map takes a uh, a slightly indirect perspective. So we have a, a sense that the geography is tipped up just a little bit, right? So we have a very good view of the mountains. Um, and this is different than what we would expect with a fully bird's eye view approach. Um, but Moses's journey is traced through this mountainous landscape, important, important events numbered and correlated with the table ver of verses on the facing page and just below the print. So here I've highlighted the path in red. Again, note the numbers. Like the land bridge preserved in the Portland map we looked at first, these discrete events have been recorded within the space of the map, providing a visual setting for the viewer, the reader to picture a diminutive Moses trekking through, each one of these numbers being a discrete moment in time. Lest you think I have pulled only the driest, most didactic examples for today, why don't we look at maps that are part of a game? How about maps that find found their way onto card decks? Beinecke insiders will know that the library is home to the wonderful carry collection of playing cards. This collection begins with pre-modern examples and continues well into the modern period with excellence versions of novelty decks, educational games, and tarot cards. What I have pulled from the collection this afternoon is an uncut sheet of playing cards. And it's not the complete deck, obviously, but it is an uncut sheet. So obviously it would then be divided up into the individual cards. Um, and these cards have images of maps of countries in Europe and Asia dated to 1820. Uh, these most likely came from Germany. Um, the language is a bit of, bit of a clue here, although you know there are other German speaking lands. Um, on each card, uh, the pips, so the hearts and the diamonds, are filled with a little fact about the country. Here, uh, the very uh, center heart, you know, declares that Italy is the most beautiful land in Europe. Maybe a little bit of a biased fact for a card, but placed right in the center there. So let's look at the others here. Well, that particular fact is surely a judgment call. I mean, Italy is gorgeous, don't get me wrong. Other facts like the area of the region, the number of its component states, um, and the number of inhabitants take on a slightly more didactic pitch. 
Map cards, however, were not a 19th century invention by any means. Uh, this is a particularly great example. Um, but this particular set here, this is actually held at the British Museum, uh, and they're dated to 1590, uh, so printed and hand colored. Um, and each one of these cards, and it's a fairly large set, I've only shown just a very small number of them here, has a map of a county of either England or Wales in the center, surrounded by uh, clouds, and we have the north, east, uh, west, and south denotations around them. Um, and then they have facts about the county and a little bit of uh, sort of colorful text at the bottom that might talk about who lives there, um, you know, what is the major like ag agricultural export of this county. Um, there's an attempt to show scale on these tiny little maps in the middle of cards as well, which I find fascinating, to be honest. So you have this little, little scale at the bottom. Um, Included in this group of cards, there are several that do not center an individual county, including there is actually an excellent card that has a picture of Elizabeth on it. It's lovely. Um, these are digitized, so should you feel you need to go page through the British Museum's collection, this is available to you. But let's look at just one specific card. Now, this one has is just focused on the total map of England and Wales. Uh, like the other cards, this one features four lines of facts at the top and a rhyming four line poem at the bottom. In this instance, the poem even serves as a sort of key to the miniature map, the center of the card, uh, noting that, you know, each of the regions is going to be noted by its first letter. So we've seen maps that can be part of a game, maps that can tell a story, but maps can also memorialize. Um, they can be used to record achievements. They can be used to sort of uh, elevate the idea of a particular achievement, whether this is an expansionist achievement or um, some type of uh, exploratory achievement. And one of the best examples in the collection is actually right here. Before we get to the uh, silver medal on the right, though, let's start with this image on the left. I adore this frontispiece. There's quite a lot going on. Um, so this belongs to Samuel Purchase's Purchase His Pilgrims, printed in 1624. Um, there is quite a lot going on, like I said, from the effigy of Queen Elizabeth I up in the right hand corner um, to the diminutive author portrait between the two globes at the bottom. Um, this work, which claimed to build on earlier examples, um, is a series of accounts of famous navigators. It actually begins with the idea of following the ancients all the way through to modern um, sort of accomplishments of the great navigators. And so here I've highlighted uh, in little orange circles uh, at the top, you can see this tiny round portrait in this gallery, this arcade of, of portraits of famous explorers. Uh, there we have Sir Francis Drake. And actually on the globe uh, to the left, we actually have a tiny ship that um, says Drake right underneath it as well. So he is present on that globe much in the way He's present on the so-called Drake Medal. So that's, that is this silver medal struck by Michael Mercador in 1589. It's one of a limited number. Um, and this object commemorates the circumnavigation of Sir Francis Drake by inscribing his journey around the world into this very thin piece of silver. Um, were you to hold it, it would fit comfortably right in the center of your hand. Um, it is wafer thin, and because it is so reflective, being made of silver, um, it actually is very challenging to sort of get a sense of what is on the metal. So hopefully here I have done a reasonable job of highlighting different elements here. Um, so I've outlined the continents in red and lightened them up a bit, and following the uh, path of his circumnavigation of the globe, um, I have imitated the sort of way that it was punched in to the uh, surface of the metal here in orange. And you can see now, maybe a little bit clearer, how an object like this uh, was made. Um, obviously, this doesn't have um, a use as far as navigation. You could not use this to navigate anywhere. This is memorializing an event, um, an achievement uh, that was uh, considered to be 
uh, monumental. Okay, but maps can also appear when you are practicing a skill. And I don't just mean when you're practicing your geography um, or you're taking a quiz, uh, but can also appear in sort of unexpected places. This is one of my favorite objects of the Beinecke. Um, and this is a map made by Amelia Giddings in 1815 when she was just nine years of age. It's not a widely circulated map. It's not used for illustrating a book and it's definitely not a useful navigational map. Um, it's worked on a linen support and the map has no scale, no directional indicators. Rather, this is an example of a sampler map here because of the condition of the map, which is actually quite good, but nonetheless, it is an embroidery um, and the sort of way that it presents in a digital sphere. I've, I've highlighted it here so you have a little bit more contrast. You can get a better sense of what we are looking at. Like many of the portalins that are on display right now, this map, as is the case with a lot of samplers, has the name of the person who executed on here. Executed in this uh, even count stitch, we have Amelia Giddings, aged nine years, in, uh, completed in 1815. And um, you may notice that across the top, it says map of England, but because the of the condition of the embroidery, um, it's pretty hard to read. So I've highlighted it here in red. As I mentioned, it's actually fairly common for people to write their names on their samplers. We all we have quite a few with names of uh, people who worked them along with the date they were completed and very often the age of the person who completed them. When working on this particular uh, embroidery map, uh, Amelia used a couple different types of stitches, ranging from the stitches used for her gold and uh, green uh, vegetal border around the outside of the map uh, to the way that she uses an even count stitch um, to write out all of the names. The idea of using a map as a topic um, for a sampler is not necessarily totally unique, even though it, it might seem something quite unusual to us today. Um, and we have two examples here uh, worked in different ways, in different manners, um, and with different levels of finishes. I've uh, zoomed in here a little bit. I was really impressed with this particular map, which again is at the Beinecke, uh, because of the way that the uh, letters and the words are actually executed. They're so finely executed that when you look at it online, you think, oh, naturally, this is either written in with a pen or this was printed and she embroidered on top of it. Um, but as you can see in the second inset detail here, um, those are actually embroidered. Like the, the names of places are embroidered. Um, they're so finely done. Uh, and you can see that she's using different types of thread to create a uh, contrast around the edge. Uh, it's, it's a slightly different type of map. Um, I mean, again, the sort of uh, cartographic accuracy is not necessarily the point. You think of these as learning tools, not only for a young woman who's learning how to stitch, uh, because it, samplers were considered sort of integral to uh, this time period and teaching young women particular skills, but it also is something that, you know, apologies for returning to the didactic again, this is a good way for you to learn all your counties or to learn all your cities or learn all your countries, right? Um, samplers that were didactic um, are actually quite common. Um, maps are just one. Uh, one of the more unusual samplers I've seen is this one with compound division at the Metropolitan Museum of Art here in New York, um, which in which uh, Mary Ann Sadler, also aged nine years, um, uh, embroidered this little bit of compound uh, division here. So finally, I want to end with a couple of maps that are really asking the viewer to take on a new perspective. One is new, very new. Uh, well, compared to everything else we've been talking about, very new, and one is old. Uh, both of them are uh, put together in such a way that they are asking the viewer to think about something that might be unfamiliar to them. This image from a 1565 Venetian volume purports to show the coastline of New France. Um, 
populated by indigenous peoples and their buildings, the artist has attempted to fill in this corner of the Americas, inadvertently acknowledging that it was only a new world to the arriving Europeans. There were already people here. However, before I give the map maker too much credit, looking closer, you will find that these indigenous figures are, are types repeated in different places throughout the area, like the rocks, the trees, and the animals, they were intended to show a European audience an unfamiliar place and cast it as wild and untamed rather than an already occupied and well-loved home. And maps like this, so this particular book of maps um, has a lot of images of the New World, of the Americas, um, in different sorts of settings with different sorts of uh, details, but it continues in this vein of you have a region, you have a coastline, you have the unknown part, the part of incognita, um, and then you have these inhabited landscapes. Um, you know, if we think of maps again as something that is navigational, something that's educational, uh, something like this has much more to do with how do you imagine this place that you may never go to. And finally, um, I love this series of maps. I think they're wonderful uh, and they're made to be incredibly practical. We have with the advent of aerial photography and eventually satellite imagery, but this is aerial photography, entirely new maps coming into being. So this is a section of a very large series of maps um, of uh, Knox County in Nebraska uh, made in uh, 1951 associated with the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And um, so I remember a map like this being uh, on my grandfather's wall. So I come from a farming family. So, you know, seeing something like this, seeing this sort of photography, uh, both is interesting in the way that we think about contemporary artists um, taking this mode of many photos and putting it together to make a whole, um, but then it also having a, you know, a moment of real practicality. But then, you know, now in 2022, you know, what kind of maps do we use? What kind of aerial or satellite photography is really useful? So I wanted to end on this image in part because I find it quite funny, a uh, map tote carried by a person studying a paper map and uh, a map tote that would be not particularly useful if you wanted to use it to get around. Um, however, they're both useful objects, right? You have a, a physical map to look at um, and then a bag which you can carry your physical map with you. Um, there are so many other objects I could have introduced today, but I hope this was an entertaining dip into the collections and the possibilities that maps present. Um, maps tell us so much about the way we think about the world, about the way we conceive of the people around us. Uh, it's more than just borders and boundaries. Um, sometimes they're intimate objects like map samplers, and sometimes they're practical objects like an aerial map of Knox County, Nebraska. Anyways, thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. Thank you so much, Kristen. Uh, we have some time for questions and answers. I encourage people to post those uh, in the Q&A. And also I've asked people and we'll share some uh, of your own uncommon cartographies, favorite unusual maps that, that you may have that don't have to be in the Beinecke collections. We've got a lot of great uh, comments and questions already. I wanted to begin with sort of the, the origin story for your medieval studies and, and, and for this exhibition. What was it that sort of led you on the path that you wanted to uh, study, uh, you know, do medieval studies and, and get into working with original materials? What was the gateway for you to, to where you are now? Um, that's a great question. So I actually started thinking that I was going to be a painter. So I spent a lot of time at the Cleveland Institute of Art before going into art history. And then I was like, oh, I'm going to do contemporary art. This is like my world I live in. Um, I love making, right? But when I actually took a medieval art history class and I was able to dig into like oh, this sort of, this obsession with making, with objects, with materials is easily transferable to looking at historical objects. Um, it just, like, my heart absolutely set aflame. Like, I knew this was the stuff, right? This is the stuff I had to look at, had to had to interact with. That's great. Uh, uh, Ray Clemens has asked, is there a relationship between the maps and the exhibit and the history of art? Which I think jumps off of what, what you were saying. And as you were talking, I was thinking about various sort of maps, uh, Lila Dog, a, a New Haven artist, has sort of great maps that she makes. And are they maps? Are they art? Uh, the answer is yes. And so I'm, 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 I liked your answer just in terms of your own origin and sort of it comes from art and what you're doing. 
may be more considered a scholarship, but it's art itself. But how about Ray's question uh, about the show itself and the relationship between the maps and uh, art history? Yeah, no, what a great question. So uh, the relationship between maps and art history is an interesting one because a lot of the objects that we're looking at in the show, we look at today, um, I think of them as art objects. Um, now I'm also trained as an art historian, so of course I do, right? Um, but there's a line, between, I don't know if there's like an established line, right? There's These are things that are completed within an environment that calls for um, very specific skills. So when we think about the people who are making engravings, who are cutting wood blocks, uh, you know, we have these artisans, we also have people who are designing these objects. Um, and when we think about, oh, I didn't include them because I was like very worried I was going to run over time. But there are these really wonderful maps that also have people in the front dressed in costumes associated with that place, right? So this adds actually a genre that is uh, is sort of uh, happens in a lot of different places at different moments. Uh, but then of course you have, you know, an artist who's drawing pictures of, you know, the people in costume um, and someone who's also making the map. I, I don't know, I think cartography necessarily includes a lot of artistry. And then now in like, you know, 2022, I, you know, I, Think of uh, Grayson Perry, like the uh, British print art artist, right? I was just at the uh, print fair at the Javits Center last weekend. And yeah, his work is everywhere, right? So we have these imaginary maps that are the ways that we can think about society, the way that we can think about points of view. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I feel like maybe in the past there had been a, a desire to draw a line and be like, this is art history. This is like cartography. But I'm not certain that um, I'm not certain that you could do that and feel really confident about it anymore. Uh, another viewer made a comment in terms of uh, multimedia, as it were, and uh, I'll quote uh, the, the comment. A musical score is another kind of map or could be seen as such in some modern scores. George Crumb, for example, may make the score spherical, not linear. Uh, this guest also says, I love maps that appear in Vermeer paintings, clearly about social class, not about navigation. Um, so it's not really a, a, a question about the sonic, but I wonder if that is a prompt that you might think about it. And perhaps you can think about curating a future show where you have uh, music that uh, maps along to the uh, visual maps. I mean, I love that. And there's definitely moments where you think about visual maps, you think about music coming together. I also love the mention of the map in the background. Um, if any of you have gone to the Tudor show in uh, New York at the Met, you will walk around and you will notice that there are maps sometimes in the backs of these images because maps are also ways of talking about power, right? Ways of talking about where we are, uh, where other people are, uh, where big events happened. Um, yeah. We have a uh, question, can you comment on the potential use of maps for propaganda purposes? Absolutely. Okay, so these got cut. Um, I was, my uh, initial run through of this talk, I went way over my time. And so I was like, okay, all right, I got to cut all these. But maps are, are an incredible, incredible opportunity for propaganda, right? Because Whose sea is it when you write down like where this sea belongs, right? Uh, who, I mean, you think of like even back to the Romans, right? What do they call the Mediterranean? Like, like our ocean, right? Our sea, like Mare Nostrum, right? Uh, but they can also be used to be like, okay, you know, this part of the country is, is the same as this part of the country. You can use it as a way to demonstrate um, control over something in an imperialistic uh, endeavor. Uh, yeah, maps absolutely can be used as propaganda. Um, I'm trying to think they're really great early modern uh, satirical images, satirical prints that use maps in this way as well. Uh, sometimes you'll have uh, like a map of Europe and like each of the countries will be personified and fighting each other. And it's, you know, speaking to a particular moment. I think the Beinecke has a handful of these from World War One, from about 1914 that, um, you know, have, take the map, you know, a you know, putative geographic visual descriptor and then change it into something that communicates in an entirely new way. Getting lots and lots of interesting uh, comments and questions. People are very taken by the embroidered maps. And I have, put in, 
I put into the chat the digital collections links for the Amelia Giddens age nine years map and the Europe work by Lydia Smith, which were two that, that came up uh, quickly that are digitized. Someone asked, were they on view? And the answer is no, they're not in the show. Uh, these are what, what you're doing. I think it's sort of like the post credit scene for a movie. It's really sort of great. It's the, the bonus scene. So they're not on view, but you could view those two. And perhaps you may know, Kristen, that there may be others that are digitized. Uh, but people are interested in those. So take some time to, to share more thoughts about those maps. Uh, and uh, Ray asked if, if you know how they came into the collections. Uh, but, but tell us more uh, and or questions that you have looking at these embroidered maps. Yeah, so there are two embroidered maps at the Beinecke that I'm aware of, and both of them are digitized. So, and at a high quality too, and you can actually, on the Amelia Gettings, they've taken time to do the back as well, which if you are a textile person like me, it's really important to be able to see both sides, right? It tells half the story from the back. The Yale Center for British Art also has a very nice embroidered map as well. Uh, as far as how these came into the collections, I'm not sure with these specific items. Um, and you would think that they're so personal, right? Like, how are they entering different collections? I'm not entirely certain. I could speculate, but I don't know for sure. Um, it is one of these items where you have uh, the sort of genre of the sampler is not new. I mean, and not 19th or 18th century, it's much older than that. And if the, actually the Met Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York has a really lovely collection of early samplers. Um, and so does the, I mean, of course the best collection is at like, you know, the v &A in London, right? They have a great collection of samplers that go back to the 1400s. So you have opportunities where people are sitting down and uh, practicing stitches, practicing patterns. Um, I'm thinking of, there's an early German sampler where someone is practicing, she practices her Latin phrases and then she's got little like religious figures that she's practiced as well. Um, while this was some, seen as something that was mostly done by women, there are examples of uh, samplers done by young boys as well. Um, and you think it's probably a, like a fantastic activity for like fine motor skills. I know that like maybe also, again, I come from a farming family. I had to make samplers as a little kid. It's like a, it's sort of a thing that continues, right? Um, but it's something that, um, has a really long and rich history and a history of, you know, if we think about this incredible sampler dealing with compound division, we're looking at, you know, somebody who's learning math and they're also applying it to something that they're making. Um, you're getting multiple schools at once. And I imagine for a lot of the maps of Europe, the maps of England, you know, this is a way that you can learn your geography, right? It's not gonna be, if you tried to navigate based on the uh, map of England we have here, probably wouldn't work out great, right? But as like an educational tool, it's wonderful. And it also gave the person who made it an opportunity to really practice um, different types of stitches around the edge as well um, with these really vivid flowers. Thank you. Um, we have a question and, and a comment and a question, uh, maybe a prompt and again, I'll quote. I really like the maps you often see around Valentine's Day depicting, depicting uh, people's hearts with all the traps and detours encountered in uh, encountered in navigating therein. I've also seen a postcard with a railway map showing the stops on the route to matrimonial bliss. So it's a sort of holiday map. And a question uh, from a sort of history of science, history of medicine, and again, I'll quote, have you run into any maps in the context of the body? I am interested in medical maps from the medieval time. Do you have any comments about this kind of map? Okay, so medical maps, um, we do have a fair number of really great anatomical images from the Middle Ages, really mostly from like the late Middle Ages, the stuff, the really wonderful early like anatomical images that are essentially a map of the body with like the veins, this sort of thing are coming through um, Arabic and Persian manuscripts, right? We have the earlier versions and they're really fantastic. They're lovely. Um, I think the, uh, Medical Historical Library at Yale actually has at least one of these that's digitized. So for the interested person who wants to go out there, as far as um, comparing the body to a map, this is harder. I have not seen this in a medical context. However, you do get images 
where um, the world becomes almost the body of Christ, where you'll end up with his head at the top, you'll get a round globe map, and you'll have his hands on one side and his feet at the bottom, which is, uh, you know, striking for all sorts of reasons, um, but isn't necessarily having like a medical correlation. Um, sometimes I guess you could think of uh, when people have maps of different regions of the world, like, you know, by temperature, correlating that with a lot of medical theory had to do with humors, which also had to do with temperature, you know, what's healthy here, what's healthy there, that could also fit into that. But as far as like a medical map, I can't think of anything at the moment. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Um, the Welcome Collection, if you check out their online catalog, you might be able to find something fun. They've got lots of weird, good stuff. Uh, your talk is generating lots of interest and enthusiasm and sharing somebody again quoting I ordered bagels from Essa Bagel, First Avenue, New York, and they arrived with a colored oversized, colored oversized postcard of New York City map. Uh, so that's fun to think of. Uh, again, a New Yorker. Uh, and and uh, my favorite uncommon map is the New Yorker cover dated December 10th, 2001, entitled New York to Stand. And the uh, Saul Steinberg papers are in Beinecke, so you could uh, do another uh, uncommon cartographies. Um, using the Steinberg papers, obviously. Uh, many of us think about the great E. Sims Campbell cartoon map of uh, the Harlem Renaissance that was on view not too long, also digitized. Um, let's yeah. talk about the show itself, though. Uh, so you've talked, again, the sort of post credit scene the extras. Um, talk a little bit about how you decided uh, and what, what, you know, what drove you to include what you included. And I'd also say, uh, you know, shout out to you and Ray. Uh, we've talked about uh, behind the scenes, as it were. This show has had lots of popular interest and engagement. It's great to see visitors gathering around, talking, and, and the labels are magnificently accessible. It's a show that speaks to and connects to scholars, and it speaks to and connects to general audiences. So I wonder if you just talk a little bit about from the beginning and as you went along, your curatorial frame and decisions that you made about what to include, and also some about the labels and descriptions, because they really are terrific. Yeah, so my way of like finding my way into this exhibit was a little bit of uh, circuitous, right? So um, if anyone, like there's probably one of my friends watching who knows my research. Um, for everyone else, I work on cloistered nuns. They don't need a map they're never leaving. Um, they're not great map makers, let me put it like that. Um, so I think about people who stay in one place uh, after in extreme enclosure. So they, unless it's an emergency, they never leave. So they're thinking about very small worlds, right? And this is the opposite of my dissertation research. So in a lot of ways, it was a new challenge that was really exciting and fun. Um, I started as uh, like a curatorial fellow uh, last fall and Ray was working on this exhibit and he was like, hey, do you want to work on this with me? And like, I went to the exhibits room and started opening boxes, just like what's been pulled, what's here, you know, what are we looking at? And just like everyone I opened and like, oh gosh, this is the best thing I've ever seen. And then the next and off, gosh, like, oh man, I want to like use this too. Um, so one of the problems we had, of course, is there's too many good objects. So we had to sort of narrow it down. So the, the window of the exhibit is actually like pretty narrow, 1400 to um, 1600. So a lot of the things I've been showing today are 19th century, they really 18th century, they really fall outside that, uh, that window. Um, and what we were thinking about is like the development of mapping during that time period. Uh, now the Beinecke's collections are extremely strong when we talk about uh, Western and European maps. Um, and so that's really where the focus of the show is, although we do have a lovely case that we've tried to bring in some other maps from around the world to, to think about, you know, what do maps mean based on where they're made? right? Because they absolute, absolutely do ma matter. Like when you look at uh, some of the portolans, some of those that are made in Venice, uh, you know what? Like England, Northern Europe, they don't really get on the map because why, right? You're not sailing there. Why would you want that? <laughs> so maps are so place and person dependent. Um, and narrowing that down was so hard. There were definitely objects that I really wanted to show that weren't going to make it just because we had too many things. When we were working on the labels, it's really a process between Ray and I going back and forth. Um, I wrote some labels, uh, he wrote some, and we read each other's work. Um, 
very briefly, I worked with somebody in museum education when I was an undergraduate. And so I was thinking back to like these questions that we were asking when we were trying to present contemporary art that can be quite challenging in very different ways, right? Very like challenge, both are challenging. Uh, contemporary art sometimes has a different edge to it. Uh, how can we write labels that bring people into the art um, and make it accessible for them? And so we were trying to sort of flex that muscle with uh, presenting these objects. And I really hope that people enjoy them because I think that they're really special. Thanks for that. Um, and I put in the in the chat the link to the exhibition website, which among other things has links to the all the labels and the exhibit brochure, uh, accessible PDFs that you can read online, download, print for yourself, share around along with some um, further descriptions and links to digitized images. So I hope people will take a look at that, share it. The, the labels really are accessible. I know folks around here are thinking about ways that we all can learn going forward uh, to, to have things that are both hit a scholarly mark and also uh, open up uh, the items to a more general audience. So again, kudos to you and Ray on the labels as well as the overall show. The show's on view till just after January 1st. And again, we're open seven days a week. So I hope that everybody who can will come and come back and, and share and be ambassadors uh, for this. Um, the next talk I'll put in the chat is going to be by Suzanne Borsch on Francesco Berlingeri's Geographia. So I'll put that link in it. And I wanted to use that as a prompt, uh, Kristen, for uh, of the items you shared, the Portolans, other items in the show that maybe you didn't know much of before joining Ray and co-curating this that have become among your favorite items. What, what are some of the other things in the show that really have struck your eye? So the Gregorio Dati, which I included early, I'm going to navigate backwards here just a little bit, um, which is actually in the, the show. This is a fabulous manuscript. Um, before starting on this, so again, my research tends to be focused in Germany and Northern Europe. So, you know, my familiarity with uh, uh, Italian geographic text in verse was almost nothing. And I remember when this was presented to me, you know, we're looking through items and I was thinking like, why would you want like, like an atlas in verse? But it's so, when, once you learn a little bit more about the, the genre, about this type of manuscript, you're like, of course, you know, it makes sense. It's, it's wonderful. It's just a very different way of approaching how you share knowledge, right? Um, this is an object in the show that I am absolutely besotted with. Another is, is we have um, a manuscript that's English that has some really lovely vovelles. And so uh, for those who don't know, a vovelle is, um, you can think of it as like an early computational device or even an early computer. Um, they will be layers of uh, circular devices that you can turn on the page, right? So it'll be like over a chart and you can turn it. Usually they're used for calculating things having to do with astronomy um, or astrology, and they are lovely. They're just really, really great. Um, there's a very well-preserved one that also is a little bit whimsical in the show. Um, and it came into our our conversation, not only because that map, that uh, manuscript also has a fabulous map in it, but also because we were thinking about the with the development of maps, with the development of thinking about uh, the globe, you're also looking at certain like mathematical and scientific advances that are coming from a lot of different places um, and meeting in cartography. So it's one of the reasons why we presented it. Um, it's hard to say. I think everything in the, like, the show is just really fantastic and everything's a little weird like everything's a little bit unexpected even when you think you know things really well um, I think I found that with some of the medieval materials as well as like oh like this person is using this towards a different end than I would have expected yeah thanks for that that's, that's really great uh two we have time for two questions um and I'll quote uh an audience member who says, as a realtor, maps are critical to my practice of commercial real estate development. I would use laminated wall size maps for site selection work, which were readily available. Now it seems that local cartologists are no longer thriving. Can you weigh in on the future of map making? And I think clearly this is about tangible, physical map making. So uh, what, what might you know, if you do, about the uh, art of physical map making uh, 
at present and uh, what, are, what are your own thoughts, hopes, aspirations, um, and predictions about physical map making? Now I'm I'm a medievalist, and so uh, my you know my intellectual practice is really in the pre-modern and actually early modern period. So as far as the history of modern map making, one there are some other really great modern maps that you might be interested in, specifically at the Beinecke that talk about how land is broken up how land is, you know, broken into parcels, who gets those parcels, that sort of thing. Um, but I do, I sometimes think about this uh, in the, the sort of, in the same vein as the tote I ended with, right? So we're moving to a place where a lot of maps seem to be physical maps. Um, it, it seemed to be pretty um, uh, novelty oriented, right? Like you can order a map of like, the stars exactly when you were born from Etsy or something like that. Um, I don't know what the future of physical maps are. Um, I mean, they're still really important. I still use physical maps when, but tends to be in things like getting around a museum, right? Um, I don't think I own an Atlas map quite like this person's using. Um, although we used to have them in our car because you never know, GPS. Um, I can't really speak to that, um, but I really hope that we still have space for people who are making like accurate cartographic maps in the future. Um, yeah. Terrific. Um, and the final question is uh, thinking some you're you're about to graduate and thinking about your uh, next chapter and, and uh, future uh, career moves. I have no doubt. I know all of us at Beinecke that whatever you do, it's going to be uh, brilliant and, and fantastic for the world. We have seen uh, your extraordinary talents here at Beinecke and, and around the Yale campus. So excited for what will be next for you and the scholarship that you will continue to create and share with the world. Um, but I wonder for audience members and those who may be watching later uh, on, on YouTube who are not yet really into archival practice and, and maybe haven't even worked in special collections, they're obviously interested uh, because they're with us today. But if you have any tips as somebody who's now skilled and practiced in working special collections of encouraging somebody to, to, to take the dive into the pool as it were, and, and some uh, tips maybe on, on how to swim amongst archival collections. So based on your great experience now, uh, what kinds of uh, tips and, and prompts might you give to newcomers uh, getting into archives and special collections? Okay, so the first is if you're interested in archives and special collections, the best way to get in there is to just go and ask, you know, make an appointment. But if it is your local historical society or the New York Public Library, almost everybody has a way for you to view things. Make your appointment and go, you know, find out, read the rules online. What are the best recommendations? Uh, different places have different expectations as far as what you can bring in a reading room, but go. And the second is it's okay to make mistakes. Like my first year at the Beinecke, just, just in like logistical uh, uh, mistakes. When I was a first year at Yale, I was always, you know, security always had to be like, hey, Kristen, like, you know, you can't, can't bring that in the reading room. And I was so embarrassed. I was like, you know what, though, I'm learning, like, I didn't know this, but now I do. Um, and also, don't be afraid to ask other people for um, ask your questions about what it's like to work in an archive or, you know, if you're going to a specific place. I mean, here's a thing that, I mean, graduate students do with each other all the time is if I'm going to a library that I've never been to before, but my friend Carson has, I send him an email and I'm like, who do I need to talk to? Like, what are the best, you know, what do I need to do here? Because sometimes it's different by institution. But basically archives are generally more accessible than you think they are. And if you have an interest, you know, follow the directions online, make an appointment and go. It's fun. It's really great. It's uh, a great way to uh, interact with history um, in ways that can be really intimate. It's, Fantastic. And, yeah. and uh, you you radiate the, uh, the joy uh, of the enterprise. So thank you for that. Uh, you really embody uh, what, what archives are and can be and what they mean and how they can be sites of both delight and uh, new knowledge. We've had more than 100 people with us live. Thank you so much, Kristen, for taking the time this afternoon for this uh, wonderful post credit scene, as well as for the great work uh, that you and Ray did in the exhibition. I will close 
by uh, quoting an audience member who I think writes for all of us. It's very straightforward. What a fun and creative presentation, exclamation point. Thank you, exclamation point. Have a great afternoon, everybody.